whole time we were awaiting this series to come, I just couldn't wait for that song, man. I just, I, lo- I hate to see the series go because <laughs> now we won't have the song for it. Yeah, and she just does, the whole band and her, Jasmine, do an amazing, amazing job. Uh, the other cool thing about this series was uh, an old geezer like me has a legitimate reason to wear some Chuck Taylors uh, without being so pathetic that uh, everybody just says, that's sad, that's sad. And I will miss this. Um, our prop guy, Brian Tedder, I mean, I just, of all the props he's ever made, I think I love this tennis shoe the best. And this, as I've said before, is a real fire hose that, that he used to make those laces with. <laughs> anyway, this is the last message in the series, and it's called Run. And uh, the series started with me quoting something from an American writer, a journalist named James Thurber. And I'd like to share that with you again, and I kind of wove this into the series, most of the messages. And... Thurber said this, he said, all men should strive to learn before they die what they are running from and to and why. It's pretty profound, pretty thought for me. All men should strive to learn before they die what they are running from and to and why. Much of our lives could be explained. A lot of the mystery could be untangled if we would just pause and do this kind of a Uh, homework assignment, as it were, between ourselves and God. What am I? Am I maybe running from something I shouldn't? Am I running towards something that I shouldn't? Or is there something I should be running toward? So I urge you again to uh, put your heart, put your mind in that place where you're open to God maybe inserting some new ideas, some new thoughts, and uh, we'll look at this last message, the run of transformation. I'd like to start by getting you to think about something. Uh, We're going to see in this message today that it deals with Two of the prominent apostles, Peter and and John. And these are guys that were just fishermen. They were not the best. They were not the brightest of their generation. They had no outstanding talent. Uh, They had really no power or wealth. There there was nothing that would make them today anything more than just like you and I. I mean, these guys were not perfect. They were not sinless. They were not the most holy. They were not the most righteous. Righteous. They weren't the most attractive physically. They were just ordinary people, ordinary, imperfect people, no different than you and I. That's the first thing I think we have to sink our hearts down into because we tend to put these apostles in some sort of an unrealistic realm where they're kind of special, saintly, floating-off-the-ground figures. These were rough, blue-collar fishermen. That's it. There was nothing special at all. And yet, here we are. 2,000 years later, and not only here, but all over the world, people gather in the name of Jesus Christ, and 2,000 years later, these fishermen, these ordinary, not the best, not the brightest, not the movers, not the shakers of their day, they are influencing people around this planet, and they have been influencing people around this planet for some 2,000 years, generation after generation. It doesn't matter what culture, it doesn't matter what nationality. It doesn't matter what a person's intellectual level is. These ordinary guys, they have positively influenced thousands and probably millions of people. Today, some 2 billion people around our planet will at least acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ in some way. That doesn't mean that they're all actually real followers of Christ. But nevertheless, they all feel to this day 2 billion strong the influence of these two ordinary guys. Now... What was the deal? I mean, what what was their secret? Why? Why were they so influential? Why are they still so influential? And does it it offer anything to ordinary folk like you and I? I mean, that's the place where I want our minds to start. I, I want you to consider, did these guys stumble onto something? Was there some kind of a secret that they stumbled onto that is available right now today to each and every one of us in this room, regardless of what stage in life we're at, regardless of what we've experienced, how many mistakes we've made, regardless of our intellectual abilities or lack lack thereof, regardless of our talent or lack thereof. I mean, can you at least start there to believe that maybe, just maybe, you could actually, from this starting point on, forget the rest of your life or up to this point, maybe you could, from this point on, actually live out the rest of your days exerting the same kind of godly, profound Christ-like influence over hearts and lives of individuals that you interact with. I mean, I I just want you to kind of start there because these guys were just like us. Uh, There was nothing that very different. Let's go ahead and and look at John chapter 20. That's page 1074. 
And what I want to suggest to you is, is this, in this message, that these were guys, the secret for them, and we can today uh, embrace their secret, was this. They encountered a life-changing paradigm, and once they encountered that life-changing paradigm, they really got serious about it. They, they embodied it. They lived with that life-changing paradigm governing their hearts, their minds, and every aspect of their life for the rest of their life. Now, as you're turning to John 20, let's, let's talk about this term paradigm a little bit. It was first used by a guy named uh, Thomas Kuhn, I believe it was his name. In 1962, he wrote a book about the scientific revolution, and he coined this term paradigm. And the idea is this. It's, it's an individual's view of reality. It, it's what a person believes about life at a given time or believes about a, a certain system of life at a certain time. For example, uh, you know, we know that uh, up until Copernicus in 1543, uh, from Ptolemy's days on, they believed that, you know, the sun went around the earth. And then Copernicus, 1543, he said, no, in fact, the earth is going around the sun. And so that was a, that was a shift, a paradigm shift. It was a completely different way of viewing life. Um, let me show you a little picture on the screen, if I can get that little picture up there. Can everybody see that now? Okay. Shout out if you see a duck. Okay? Shout out if you see a rabbit. How many see both? Yeah. I mean, you've probably seen this little thing before. Again, Thomas Kuhn, you know, had it in his book. Um, it, it's to illustrate a paradigm shift that you can be looking at the same body of truth, the same reality, but see it in a different way, uh, and it can change, it can change everything if you encounter a life-changing paradigm. Now, we're going to look at these guys, uh, John and Peter, on an early morning run. And the context is this. The one that they loved more than life itself had been crucified two days earlier. Uh, the one that they had pinned all their hopes on, the one that they believed was none other than the Christ, the Messiah of God, the Savior of the world, the one that they had seen heal every disease known, the one that they had seen release people from demonic bondage, the one that they had seen actually open blind eyes and raise people from the dead itself, the one that they saw walk on water, the one that they believed could actually save the human race uh, from our greatest enemies, which are sickness and pain and death and disease. You know, they saw Jesus had the power to do this. The one that they heard words from that they had never heard the likes of, the one that loved in a way that they had never seen or heard possible. The one that expressed what God was like to them in a way that gave them hope and joy and freed them up. That one was nailed to a cross some two and a half days earlier. And they saw their dreams. They saw their hopes. They saw their world just crash down. Uh, their hearts collapsed. Even though the Lord Jesus had on some four different occasions at the beginning of his ministry, in the middle of his ministry, twice at the end of his ministry, he told these guys, he said, I will go to Jerusalem. I'll be rejected by the leaders. I'll be crucified, but I will rise again the third day. Four times, all through his three and a half year ministry, he just kept that truth before their eyes, but they, they just couldn't accept that he was talking about something literal, that he was actually going to be brutalized, actually going to be nailed to a cross, actually going to rise from the dead. And when it happened, you probably recall the story they were so confused when they came to arrest Jesus, they were expecting him to use his power to take control of the situation, to ultimately take control of the world. Jesus just looked absolutely helpless. He looked helpless and maybe to them a little confused, though he was not. They were the ones confused. And he yielded to the brutality. He didn't say anything to resist the crooked trial that he was getting. And then when he was brutalized and mocked on the cross, he just looked helpless. He just looked weak, and they started to really question, what does this mean? Who was he? Why doesn't, why doesn't he do anything? And so they ran. They were, they were actually pretty cowardly. They were honest men in their confusion. They ran. Peter even denied him three times. And now it's nearly three days later, and one of the women has gone to the tomb of Jesus and come back with this report that the tomb is wide open, and Jesus' body is not there. Let's pick up reading in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. It says, Early on the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb 
and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. This is interesting. John, who's the writer of the Gospel of John, he, he calls himself the other disciple. You'll, you'll see he, he says something else about himself later. Um, the other disciple, and then he says, the one Jesus loved. <laughs> it's kind of like, I know I was Jesus' main man, he's saying, but, but I don't want to say I'm John, you know. <laughs> so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. Here's the run of transformation. But the other disciple, this is kind of a cool little thing he puts in there. The other disciple did what? He outran Peter. It's commonly known that John was the youngest of the apostles, so he was just probably faster and younger, you know. So he outruns Peter to the tomb, and he reached the tomb first. He bent over, and he looked in, and the strips of linen lying, lying there, but did not go in. So John gets to the tomb first. He looks in, and these embalming strips that would have gone around the body, and then there was an embalming cloth separate that goes around the head. He sees them lying in there, but John is, is a little fearful to actually enter into the tomb himself. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived, and he went into the tomb. You know, Peter's not going to hesitate. He goes right in. He saw, now listen to this part carefully. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus, what? Jesus' head, and I'll explain all this to you in just a bit. And the cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Now, let me give you this, um, a little more explanation on, on this linen situation, these burial cloths. They would have taken linen strips and just wrapped the body, okay? And then they put it, you know, they put scented perfume and different things. And then the head cloth was separate that they would put on a body. And what these guys found was when they went to the tomb, it was like the long part that would have went around the body, it was laying there just compressed like that. And the head part was thrown off to the side. It was as though somehow the impossible had occurred. The physical body had escaped through this little opening, which can't possibly be true if they would have found all the linen just tossed off all over the place that would have been a little more plausible but that's not what they found they found it collapsed and just the head part thrown to the side indicating the thing that the Lord Jesus had said repeatedly that he had actually risen from the dead now this run of these guys to this tomb to find the resurrected Jesus completely changes their life now think back again when they grabbed Jesus in the garden and they arrested him, these guys were scared. They ran. They hid for two days. Their world was crashing down on them. They were depressed. They were terrified. They didn't want to show their face. They thought they were going to be next. After this event, these guys were never the same. Never. Their value system changed completely. Their courage returned in a way that never left them for the rest of their life. They went from this point on telling everyone, everywhere, at any given time... The truth about life can only be known when you put it, put it in Jesus Christ. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. He lived, he loved, he sacrificed his life on the cross. He sufficiently paid for the sins of the world. And he rose from the grave just like he predicted. And they told men and women, boys and girls, enemies and friends for the rest of their days. They never shrunk back from this message. They did all the good they could in the name of this one Jesus because they learned the truth about life. That Jesus was more powerful than all of the forces in the world. You know, all the schemes, all the plots, all the brutality that put him on the cross and took his life. When he rose from the grave, he showed that he was superior to any of those forces. He showed that all the promises that he had given, that he would return, he would establish his kingdom on earth, that it would be an everlasting kingdom in which there's no more sickness, sorrow, pain, or death. He showed by his resurrection that that was absolutely truth they could take to the bank, they could build their lives on, they could trust in. They encountered a life-changing paradigm when they saw Jesus had actually risen from the dead. That death didn't have the last word. That brutal, brutal politics didn't have the last word. That the movers and the shakers, that the talented, that the best and the brightest didn't have the last word. It was Christ. And that would also mean that his followers would have the last word. And this 
this encounter, this life-changing paradigm completely, completely changed the trajectory of these men's lives. They were never the same again. Never, ever, ever. And if you and I take seriously this one little truth, the fact that Jesus Christ actually rose from the grave, actually is alive, actually awaits the time of his return, actually is present in each and every person that puts their faith in him and opens their heart, that has the potential to completely set you and I on a transforming journey that can absolutely change not only you, but every other life that you ever brush against. And that's what I know that God wants to, to offer to some of us today because it's been on my heart in the first service and it's on my heart again. There's many of us that we're so familiar with this truth that it's like blah, 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 wah, wah, wah. You know, it just doesn't even move us. We've heard it a million times. And some of us have heard it and we're aware of it and we would even say that, yeah, I believe it's true, but it's never gripped our hearts. It's never become a life-changing paradigm. It's kind of stayed, you know, as just something that, yeah, it's nice to know, nice to, nice to understand. There's a guy that, his name is Ian uh, Leish, and he's a Christian writer. He was asked to come to a friend of his his business and just do some teaching and training on encouragement and so forth with some of the people um, that were on his staff. He did this, and at the end, he had one lady that came to him, and she said, you know, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about my own spiritual journey and where I'm at. Now that uh, she was deeply in love and about to be married, and then her boyfriend uh, was killed in a car accident. She was in the car as well and was greatly injured and had to go through multiple surgeries and just had a hard, hard time, you know, for many years. And she told uh, Ian, she said, you know, I think at that point, I lost my faith. And he said he shot up one of those prayers because, you know, it's like, how do you answer someone like that? And he prayed real quick, and then he answered. And this is what he found coming out of his, his mouth. He said, did you lose your faith? Or did your faith never exist? You never had it in the first place. You see, if she would have had faith in Christ... Whatever trial she would have gone through, whatever changing circumstance, it would not have displayed itself like that. It would have displayed itself quite the opposite by pressing closer to Christ, by seeking his strength, by seeking his presence and, and never shaking in her approach toward God. But she had a false God. She had a God that was supposed to fix everything the way she wanted it. So she had faith in not the real Christ who has told us exactly what to expect in this life. But she was trusting in some made-up God that was going to be a bless-me machine and a gimme and a do-me machine. You see, real faith will, will demonstrate itself. And if you and I have an encounter with the risen Christ, that's a faith that will endure any kind of circumstance. Listen to the words of these apostles in Acts chapter 10, 39. This was actually the apostle Peter. He just kind of says it matter-of-factly to a group of people. He says, hey, we are witnesses of everything he, meaning Jesus, did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day, and he caused him to be seen. He was not, only see, he was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So they just had this, this absolute certainty that changed their view of life. It changed the way they related to people. And they felt like this information was so wonderful, so good, that there's a real God that created everything with a purpose and a design who loves each and every human being, that every human being is totally forgivable and totally delightful to this God, that if any human being would be willing to return to him, to trust him, to restore that faith, obedience, relationship for which we were created, that this God offered forgiveness of sin and everlasting life, and he had proven that he can give everlasting life in a beautiful world by the resurrection of Jesus. It proves this is the real deal. They were convinced. They risked their lives, and they all died a martyr's death, and they did so without the slightest twinge to shrink back because they were convinced they had a life-changing encounter with this Christ. I came across a story by Jim Cimbala, a pastor up in New York. He talks about a guy named... Fernando Aranda. Fernando Aranda uh, was a guy who grew up on the streets and 
you know, got into the whole drug life and the violence and ended up in jail doing some theft and things like that. And his final sentencing was a very severe one. He was given 25 years to life, young man and now facing a potential life sentence. Um, he was in the jail and his mother, 70-year-old mother, came to visit him. And when she saw him being brought out, you know, shackled to meet with her, uh, she just shattered and cried her eyes out and, and just said, I don't want this this view of you to be the last view that I ever have of you, son. I, I can't stand to think you'll end your life in this condition. You'll end your life in this hellhole. And this hardened street guy, uh, at that point, he says he, he just kind of broke. He just couldn't stand to see his mother's tears like that. And so Fernando Aranda, he, he prayed one of those prayers, those kind of foxhole prayers. He said, you know, God, if you're there and if you ever get me out of this place, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. He ended up doing 13 years, and then he actually was released, which was a very good situation considering he had 25 years to life. And when he got out of jail, what do you think he did? Do you think he followed through on that prayer? No, he didn't. He went right back to the streets, right back to his old haunt, right back to the drugs, right back to the violence. And then one period of time, he was on a three-day drug binge with his buddies, and they were out in a park near a park in New York City, and they saw the, um, the drug tactical people mixing in with the crowd. And they recognized him and they were scared to death because he knew for him it would mean back to jail probably for life. So they saw a large group of people in the park on the other side. And he ran over there to be with them. And as soon as he got near this crowd of people that were gathered in the park, one of the individuals came up to him and said, Do you know that Jesus Christ loves you? And his words were, I was repulsed. I was repulsed, and all I wanted to do was get away. He says he started to get away, and then he looked up, and he saw the, the tactical drug force moving closer in, and he decided that was not a good move, so he went further into this crowd of people. There seemed to be some sort of rally they were holding, these, these Jesus freaks. And so he went into the midst of the crowd. Some of you know what it is to try to hide out in a crowd. You've had your days. And so he's in there with them. <laughs> and, uh, and then he says the thing that happened next he could have never, ever imagined. He said this big, muscular guy with a big, thick mustache, he describes as looking like the Marlboro Man. Some of you are not old enough to remember the Marlboro Man. But um, he says this guy comes all, right up to him like he knew him, comes straight up to him and says, Hey, bro, you remember that prayer you prayed in jail? What about that? And this hardened street guy, Fernando Aranda, said, Everything inside him just started collapsing down. He said, and then this big muscular guy literally took his finger and pointed right, just tapped right on the forehead. He said, bro, you know what you got to do. You know. And he said, he, before the group of people, didn't even care. He said he fell to his knees and he turned to God. You see, he had encountered a life-changing paradigm. He couldn't conceive of a God that would communicate with someone like him, a God that would take this sort of a desperation, con job sort of a prayer seriously and then call him up on it later. It completely changed his life. It turned out this group was some uh, group called Victory Outreach and they dealt with prisoners and drug addicts. They ended up taking uh, Aranda, uh, Fernando Aranda into one of their houses and taking him through the whole rehabilitation process and this guy is a follower of Christ. He encountered a life-changing paradigm. He couldn't conceive of a God that would penetrate into his world through a stranger and talk directly to him. He couldn't imagine that his life mattered that much to anyone, much less God. And that life-changing encounter set him on a different course for the rest of his days. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, to those that are followers of Christ, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy... He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Man, when you get a hold of this, when, when, when the resurrection of Christ lays hold of your heart and becomes a life-changing paradigm, you start seeing the whole world differently. First of all, you're delivered from the, i got to get myself calm to even say it. You're delivered from the, the superficial stupidity that drives most of the people that we interact with. 
Don't you know the crowd, they're trying to get the bigger, better, newer, nicer. They're living in desperation, thinking they have to get it all now, taste it all now, experience it all now, get all you can while you can because you don't know how long you're going to live. You don't know how long you're going to be here. They live with, with chronic desperation, and they're shallow, and they're pitiful, and they're selfish, and they seek to suck everybody that comes into their realm of influence right down the tubes with themselves. And man, when you know that Jesus is alive, that he rose, you are freed from that insanity, that stupidity, that frantic, desperate uh, way of living. You know that you don't need it all now. You can't get it all now anyway. And if you get it all now, it doesn't last long enough because we're all out of here in a short season. And we're either headed for our eternal destiny or not. But when you get a hold of the resurrection of Christ, you're free. You're free from that that desperate attempt to taste it all, get it all, feel it all, do it all now. And you can take your life out of a self-centered mode and you can become a life that is laid out and a life that gives to the rest of the world around you. Because you don't have to get it all now. You know your day is coming. Just as Jesus rose from the dead, so he will provide that eternal good life for each and every one of his followers. And so we're freed from that. It changes our vision of life. It changes our values. What was once very important and we chased it and pursued it, all of a sudden becomes not so important. What was not important at all suddenly becomes very important. God's word, God's will, his purpose, his plans becomes very important. Once you know Jesus rose, his kingdom is coming. His will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it changes our priorities, or at least it's supposed to. Our values and our priorities in life start to change. We start to see things the way Christ sees them. We start to feel about things the way Christ feels. And if we start to let this truth soak down deeply enough, we start to do the things that Christ wants to do in that circle of influence that you and I have. You know what one of our biggest problems is today? We look at these apostles and we say, okay, gee, those guys have been influencing you know, millions of people for 2,000 years like I'm ever going to do that. And it's this, this sort of a, a, a poor estimate of your potential, my potential, that I think kills a lot of us from ever doing what God created us to do. Listen, how many of you have ever heard a story on TV where somebody, could be a man, could be a woman, they, they uh, come alongside a kid or maybe it's another adult that's just hitting one of those difficult times in life. And so this man, this woman comes alongside of them and just pours their life into this kid or into this needy person. And, and they just literally have a transforming positive influence on that person. You, you see those stories every once in a while on the news. And, and honest to goodness, if you're like me, you, you hear those stories and something wells up inside you and you're, you're ready to just burst into tears. How many have ever had one of those experiences like that? And you think, that person is beautiful. They're they're a hero. How lovely is their life that they would do this? That's where you got to stay. That's where you got to stay. Don't be thinking in terms of, oh, I'm never going to be like those apostles and influence thousands and millions of people. Listen, every human being is, is a universe in itself, inside of you. You know this to be true. You are a literal complex universe. You are precious. You are valuable. You were created in the image of God. You were created by Christ and for Christ. Your life is of immeasurable value. Immeasurable. And when you and I, when you and I are affected by this life-changing paradigm of Christ's resurrection, and then we just let it start to work out through us, and maybe, maybe it's only one child's life, our child maybe, or, or some other child, or some friend, or some family member, or just some, maybe just one life. We're not even aware, perhaps, of the impact. It matters. It matters in the sight of God. It will matter eternally in the sight of heaven. You cannot sell yourself short. You can't have this all or nothing mentality. I'm either going to influence thousands or millions, or I shouldn't even try. One life is so, so important and precious in the sight of heaven. And we can't sell ourselves short. We need to have an encounter of this sort, a life-changing encounter with the resurrection of Christ, and then to embody it. Let it start to sink in. Like I said, let it start to affect our vision and our values and our priorities. Let it readjust our expectations in this life. You know, let it start to affect the way we actually live and we start making lifestyle adjustments. And that's the next thing that we see going on. Now, I just want to give you a little rundown very quickly of the people that actually saw Jesus 
risen from the dead. Because the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, this would have been a really good Easter message, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty overwhelming. You know, The very fact that Jews that held the Sabbath day, Saturday, so sacred, started hanging out and worshiping on Sunday was really pretty remarkable. The fact that all Jesus' enemies would have ever had to do was to come up with a body and they could have stopped Christianity forever, but they couldn't. The fact that there was a Roman guard that was fearful, or that everybody had fear for at that tomb, and they couldn't stop whatever happened there. That's pretty sound evidence. But then you have all these people. Mary Magdalene, you know, she was the first. Unlikely character. She sees Jesus risen. There were two other women that see Jesus risen. There were two disciples on the road to Emmaus, unnamed. They see him risen physically. They talk with him and walk with him. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, sees him risen. All the apostles saw him. They ate with him after he had risen. The Apostle Paul says at one time there were 500 people at once gathered and Jesus physically appeared to them. The book of Acts says for 40 days he continued to physically appear to people. James, Jesus' half-brother, who did not believe in his brother as the Messiah when he was alive, when he sees Jesus risen from the dead, he has one of those life-changing encounters and he becomes a follower of his half-brother. And then the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was... The man that tried to single-handedly stamp out Christianity until the risen Jesus appeared to him in Acts chapter 9. He hated, he hated Jesus. He hated the whole scene, the whole Christian scene, until he realized, I can't deny this. This is reality. And this enemy said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And for the rest of his life, this man, the Apostle Paul, for the next 30 years of his life, he gave everything he had the most beautiful servant of God that ever lived. He went through hardships that none could imagine, and he never shrunk back. What would happen? What would happen? I, I, I'm just going to talk very frank to some of you. Some of you, you know, you're kind of, a, you're kind of one of these fence-like followers of Jesus. I don't know how else to put it. You're, you're kind of like sympathetic. You're kind of there, but you're not there. You're, I guess I'm trying to say you've never really thrown your all uh you know jesus resurrection has never so affected you that you said let the rest of the world do what it wants i'm going to surrender my life to christ i'm going to assess what i have my talents my abilities my time my treasure and i'm going to pour my rest of my life out for christ i'm going to find the good the good that's right in front of me that god's put there and i'm going to do it and then i'm going to do it again tomorrow and the next day and the next and some of you have never did what Paul did, the enemy of Christ. He said, Lord, what would you have me to do with my life? And I want to challenge some of you right now that you've never done that. You've got your own agenda. You've been pursuing your own agenda. How's it going? Jesus is here today saying, will you be my servant? And I'm challenging some of you to say for the first time in your life, Lord, what would you have me to do? with the rest of my life because if you do that you'll be on a journey you'll be on an adventure the likes of which you could never imagine these men were not the best they were not the brightest they were ordinary just like us but they had surrendered hearts if your heart becomes a surrendered heart man then the journey gets interesting God will put you in circumstances and you'll meet people that you wouldn't have met and you'll develop skills and abilities that you wouldn't have developed in any other way you'll try things that at first seem challenging and overwhelming but you try them and you depend on God and you cry out to him for strength and you develop new capacities and then you meet somebody else and the journey goes on and on and on and you'll be shocked you'll be shocked at where you go and who you become and what you do you just have to start with a surrendered heart and that good that's right there in front of you you just do it today and you do it tomorrow and you just keep moving you embody you embody this life-changing paradigm jesus rose eternity is real it's coming and all the truth that jesus spoke about life you let that become the world view that governs you and it changes everything in your life and it'll cause you to be a change agent in a positive way in a wonderful way with everybody you interact with listen to what the apostle paul says in second corinthians 5 16 he says so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view you see from a worldly point of view we we assess a person's value by um you know how smart they are how educated they are how talented they are how attractive they are uh, how much wealth they have how much power uh paul says Jesus' resurrection from the dead just cured all that. He says, we don't regard anyone from a worldly point of view anymore. 
For Christ's love compels us. He died for who? For all. That means every human being we ever meet has extraordinary eternal value. Every human being should be treated with dignity. Every human being has amazing potential if they open their heart to Christ. And so we see people differently if we've had this encounter of a life-changing paradigm. We, we just see the potential. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for who? Say it again. Should no longer live for who? Who are you living for? Really. Really. I mean, you know, how comfortable would you be to say, you know what? Scrutinize me. Examine every pocket of my life. Look at, look at my whole life. Look at my schedule. Look at the way I handle my money. Look at the way I use my time and my talents. Just go ahead. You scrutinize me. And you tell me, am I living for myself or am I living for Christ? Would you be comfortable with that? That the result would be the person would say, I tell you, man, God bless you. Hats off to you. You are a fully devoted follower of Christ. You're living for Christ. Remember, we're not talking about remarkable Mother Teresa kind of stuff. We're talking about living out the life that Christ lays out for us, just doing the good thing that's right in front of us, just sharing Christ with our small influence or circle of influence, just living obedient to the Word of God, just growing a little bit each day. It kind of is not so flashy, but it really matters. He says, we're no longer to live for themselves, but for him, meaning Christ, who died for them and was raised again. Here it is again, embodying a life-changing paradigm that this reality that Jesus rose affects us so much we just literally live for him, actually live for him. Not verbally, not just on Sunday, but actually 24-7. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. An ambassador represents another country, you know. We are to be representatives, ambassadors of this eternal paradigm. We are to be representatives of the kingdom of heaven. We are to be spokesmen and spokesladies for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, God's entrusted that much to each and every one of us. We are his change agents in this world. It's a guy named Ted Neely, and he has an interesting story. He, um, he has played the role of Jesus uh, in Jesus Christ Superstar for 30 years um, he's actually 64 years old now, and he's still playing the part, which is kind of weird when you think about it, because Jesus was crucified at about age 33. This dude is like ancient. He's 64. They must pack a lot of makeup on Jesus for the crucifixion. I mean, you know, he's really old to be crucified. Um, I'm getting close to that age, but, but I'm not there yet. But, <laughs> but um, they did an interview, Chicago Tribune, just this year. You know, they said, hey, you've done this for so many years. You know, you've played the role of Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar. I forgot to tell you that. Um, I had, when I was, before I was a Christian, I had a, a girlfriend of mine drag me to go see that. Man, I didn't want to go. I, I, I knew anything that had to do with God was not a good place for me to be the way I was living at that time. But I, I went, and it didn't have any impact on me or anything. It was kind of silly. But anyhow, this guy, 30 years playing this role. And so they started asking him in this interview, you know, uh, spiritual questions. So, well, you know, like, are you, you know, are you a follower of Jesus? He says, he says look. Look, this is a performance. That's all it is. And when I read that, I thought, that's, that's just amazing. That's just astounding. But maybe it's not so astounding. That a person can be that familiar, that exposed to a life-changing paradigm like the life and resurrection of Jesus is, and yet not take it into their heart, never embody it, never be affected by it. But you know and I know that's real possible. And I know and you know the Spirit of God is, is just reaching in in an uncomfortable way into some of your hearts and lives, even this morning, and saying, you're not much different to this point than somebody just playing the role of a follower of Christ. It's never reached deeply, thoroughly, everlastingly into your soul. And some of you, he's saying, come on, come on, this is your day. This is your day. Well, these guys went on to live for the rest of their life as individuals that didn't ask the set of questions that people apart from 
the realization of a resurrected Christ asks. You see, people apart from Christ, they ask things unconsciously like, what am I going to get out of this? What are you going to do for me? You, you know, how comfortable are you going to make me? What, what, what benefit am I going to get out of this? What profit? Uh, I don't want to lose anything. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to be inconvenienced. That's the kind of questions that fill the minds of people that have not been uh, transformed, have not embodied this life-changing paradigm of a risen Christ. It's what can I get? How much can I take? What can I accumulate? Uh, how much can I accrue from this? These are the kind of synthetic, shallow questions that drive. They are the things that people are running toward and running away sometimes from truth and reality and depth and meaning. You know, when you get a hold of Christ and his resurrection, you ask a different set of questions. You say to people and everybody you encounter, how can I serve you? What can I give to you? What can I do for you? How can I bless you? How can I be a channel of the love of Christ to you? How can I let you know in some way how precious you are in the sight of God? How forgivable you are? How wanted you are by God? How much meaning your life has, regardless of what you're thinking? You see, those that have been affected by this, this life-changing paradigm ask a different set of questions of life. They don't say, what can I get? They say, what can I give? They don't say, what are you going to do for me? It's what can I do for you? God, what can, what can I do for this person in this situation? Because we're free. We know we don't have to get it all now because you can't get it all now anyway. But we do get it forever later on in the right way. And so we go through this life embodying this life-changing paradigm. And we become what Jesus calls salt and light we are influencers. We affect those that we encounter. And many, many lives end up, long after we've passed through them and long forgotten it, they end up being eternally positively affected because we really did embody the truth. I want to close with um, a familiar, uh, familiar story to most of us. Uh, you know, do you guys like watching Christmas movies this time of year? I mean, I got like a whole set of them, my wife and I, that we watch. You know, National Lampoon Christmas is always one I like, you know. But, but on a more serious note, uh, my favorite of all time is It's a Wonderful Life, right? And that thing, you know, you can, you can watch it a gazillion times. And if you're anything like me, it's still, there's parts of that thing. Uh, well, I can't even talk about it now. That's how bad it is. I mean, you know, it, it, just, it just gets you. And... Um, you know the story, you know, um, George Bailey is just this ordinary guy, and, uh, you know, he has these dreams of traveling around the world and building great buildings and bridges and so forth and so on, and his dad owns this little savings and loan, you know, in, in the little town of Bedford Falls, and just as George is getting ready to go away, his dad suddenly dies, and George, being the good guy that he is, he sweeps in and takes over the business, and he just gets stuck in Bedford Falls, and, uh, you know... He marries and has a bunch of kids, and, and, and to him, his life was never, never what it was meant to be, that he had sort of missed the exciting calling, the great adventure that was always meant to be. And then, of course, one day, Uncle Billy, remember Uncle Billy, you know, he, he loses the $8,000 deposit, and uh, the bank, the bank examiner comes, and now George is actually uh, potentially going to go to jail, and, and he's just, just so angry and so depressed, and and uh, he realizes that he's got this life insurance policy, and he comes to the conclusion that he's better off. He's of more value to his family, dead than alive. And he goes out in town, and he gets up on the bridge, you know, remember? And he gets ready, you know, and he jumps in the water to kill himself. And then Clarence Oddbody, this rather strangely dressed angel, um, I never did understand that part. I mean, the whole lacy thing always threw me a curve. But he, the strangely dressed angel jumps in the water after him and saves him. And um, then this conversation starts, you know, and uh, Clarence is trying to explain to him, George, George, you know, heaven, <laughs> this is so silly, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, you know, you matter to heaven, uh, heaven sent me down, God sent me down for you, George, and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, George, this is just what I need, you're an angel, right, 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 and he says, no, no, it, it's real. And, and George mumbles something like, you know, it just would have been better off if I never would have been born. And um, Clarence looks up to heaven, you know, and he says, uh, Lord, what do you think? You know, and, okay, George, 
you've never been born, you know. And um, you recall George leaves and he starts heading back into town because he's, he's wondering what, what this is really all about and finds his wrecked car is not there and his lip is not bleeding anymore. He races home because he wants to see what's really going on and he, and he gets to the place that should have been his home and his mother answers, but it's not the mother that he knew. And she, of course, she didn't know him at all. Why? He had never been born. And he sees instead of this sweet, loving, warm woman that he knew as a child, this hardened, suspicious woman that's, that's um, making a living by bringing in boarders. And, and he can't believe his eyes. And his mother, of course, doesn't know him at all. And he runs away from there. And he goes and he finds Uncle Billy. And Uncle Billy is locked away in a mental asylum, you know. He uh, goes and tries to find his wife, and he finds her as this tragic, spinster, paranoid lady uh, librarian, and she's terrified when he tries to even greet her. He, uh, he goes through the town, a beautiful little town of Bedford Falls, and it's sickening. It's full of strip joints and bars, and, and it's just, it's horrible. It's a cesspool of iniquity, and it's called Pottersville, I believe, at this point, because of the wicked old wealthy man mr potter he he goes and he looks for the home complex that he had made so many loans to the people that they could just have a decent place to live you know and and it's all gone instead it's a cemetery and he finally gets it that one life matters and and when i'm just so scared and i know you guys probably sick of hearing me say this sometimes I am so afraid that the thing that we are most capable of is just wasting. You you got this one life. It really matters. You have so much potential. You are so important and precious in the sight of God. And he wants to do things through your life. And and what you consider small, you know, just just your good treatment of people, your listening to a friend, the the nice things you've long forgotten about. That was the the whole deal with George. George didn't think that his life mattered. His life mattered way more than he ever could have dreamt. It set off this chain reaction. And yours does too. And mine does too. And if we will allow this life-changing paradigm that Jesus Christ is alive and risen to affect us. And we just start doing the simple good things that are in front of our face today and an hour later and tomorrow. God will just keep moving us through life. And it won't be until eternity that we'll be able to see the amazing, positive, transformational impact that this life-changing paradigm of Christ's resurrection has not only had on us, but on multitudes of other lives. You've got to believe that God will do something beautiful through your life. You just, got, you just can't leave here today not believing that. And you can't leave here today. I plead with you, thinking the same way about yourself and about life that you came in here today. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, you you spoke the way no one ever spoke. You did things that no one's ever done on earth. You showed that you were more than competent to save us from all the ills that terrify us. Hatred, prejudice, disease, death itself. You rose from the grave showing that nothing could conquer you. We are in good hands when we trust you and follow you fully. And you demonstrated and you show that each and every life with you in our hearts ruling and reigning is so full of potential to bless and to change the lives of others. How I pray, Father, that the the power of heaven would move the hearts of some that have never actually made the decision to put their faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and follow him fully. I pray that this day they'll, they'll hear heaven. They'll sense in the depths of their being that this is the way. Walk in it. And I pray for the rest of us maybe that have just sort of gotten sort of off path. It's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to be deceived and embrace the insane value system of this world that we live in. May you free us this morning. And may we be those that embody this eternally powerful paradigm of the risen Christ and all that it means. May you make it so, I pray, Father, in Christ's name.
Amen.